Hello my dear friends, how are you today? I hope you are ready for my new excursion because today I am in an amazing city, it's Antibes and I'm invite, I invite you to the Museum of Pablo Picasso. Unfortunately, one of the levels uh, was uh, closed uh, because it will be a new um, exhibition there. So, we will see only one level with the works of Pablo Picasso, but anyway, they are beautiful. Let's go! During the Second World War, Pablo Picasso mainly lived and worked in Paris. In the summer of 1946, Picasso left Paris for the south of France with his new partner, the young painter Françoise Gelot. They went to Goldjuan, where Picasso rented a little house by the port. When he met with Romuald de, de la Souchère, Picasso expressed a desire to have more space to be able to paint. And so the curator of Chateau Grimaldi suggested he used part of the museum as a studio. Picasso moved in in mid-September 1946. He set up his studio on the second floor of the museum. During, the, uh, during his period at the Grimaldi Museum, the artist worked intensely. When he left for Paris nearly two months later, Picasso left the majority of his work in situ. The museum visit invites you to share a rare and precious moment to let you discover Picasso's work in the very place where it was created and feel how this exceptional environment influenced the art practice of one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. A festival from antiquity is taking place on the beach. There are two musicians and a nymph dancing while two kid goats are galloping around. In the painting shown here, the theme refers to the happiness of newfound peace after the dreadful conflict of the Second World War. We can also see in this composition a long-awaited response to the joy of life, a painting executed by Matisse in 1905. The joy of life had been reworked several times. Picasso had indeed transformed his characters, stiff and massive in the beginning, they have become more slender. It's hard at first glance to see here the portrait of a fisherman or mariner, who Picasso must have glimpsed at the port, sitting with his legs crossed, head tilted forward and gobbling up a sea urchin. And uh, nonetheless, you are in front of a man of the people, concentrating on his prosaic act, the pleasure of eating what the sea provides. During his stay in the museum, Picasso, along with Michel Simon, found a little wounded owl. The artist looked after it until it was better and decided to keep it. Here it's represented along with another important element related to his time in Antibes, sea urchins, shown in, th in three different ways on the white form of the plate. Picasso made this still life when he first arrived at the castle. As Françoise Gelot explained, Picasso was trying to capture the atmosphere of the place. Most of all, he talked about the white light in Antibes that glorified forms rather than color. It is true that uh, in this composition Picasso has given the objects a simplified and geometric formal perfection. It is certainly the light that constructs this still life. The objects are placed in a beam of light coming from a strongly emph emphasized star-shaped source.
Picasso's still lives are made up of modest objects, household items or food. These things offer a veritable vocabulary of forms and images that express the painter's thoughts. In Antibes, these forms were elliptical and geometric, but, but they also testified to Picasso's daily life and his joy at rediscovering the taste of the Mediterranean and evoke the happiness of the afterwar period. This is what Françoise Gillot said about the series painted mostly on recycled canvases. The little painted canvases with um, their variety of fish, octopus and other seafood are inspired by meals in the port at Antibes or the port in Gaudjoan where you can find these dishes. But more than anything, all of these octopuses and fish came from the Mediterranean, so dear to his heart. She was so fat and her cafe so narrow that she could barely get inside, so she stayed outside to welcome her clientele. She had a funny little turned up nose sticking out from under the peak of a huge man's cap. This was how Françoise Gillot described the sea urchin cellar you see in front of you in her book. In Antibes, Picasso increasingly developed his taste for simplification and the geometrization of forms, and this is especially true in his series of large still lives on plywood. The tension between reality and painting is omnipresent here. As he himself said, nature can only be translated into painting by using signs. But you can't invent a sign, you have to really aim for a resemblance to end up with a sign. Picasso painted these fishermen rather comically, resting on his elbow at the table in a bar at the port. He has fallen asleep like this, with his head tiled, his nose in the air, and we can almost hear him snoring. One of his arms is hanging down the side of his body, the other resting on the table and holding up the weight of his head. The angle of his elbow represented as a triangle, fingers folded in words. The painting you are looking at now is unique in Picasso's work, and not without good reason. It was the first and only time that the painter worked on the figure of Ulysses, a key character in Homer's Odyssey, the Greek hero went through many adventures that stopped him from getting back home. Here Picasso represents one of these episodes, the one where the hero sails uh, close to the island of mermaids. A careful and sly man, Ulysses was aware of the risk he was taking, and so he asked his sailors to tie him to the mast, 
so that he could listen to the mermaids and chanting and deadly sound in safety. In just three days by the artist, this large composition was a commission from the museum's curator. But watch out, this is not a canvas, because Picasso painted Ulysses and the mermaids on three panels of fibrous cement and covered up the screw holes with paint. These two sculptures were inspired by Marie-Thérèse Voltaire, who was Picasso's lover at that time. Her beauty incited the artist to work with rounded forms, full of softness and sensuality. 